So uh, thank you, Dean Dahlberg. And uh, I'm, I appreciate being asked to come here as a person who came to Syracuse just like any one of you, I imagine. Didn't really know what I wanted to do, didn't know where I wanted to go, and uh, really came here to see basketball. But uh, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, get into the engineering degree uh, curriculum here and graduated with a mechanical engineering degree. Uh, one of the things that uh, I got asked about five months ago if I could be here today, and just like when I was here as a student, I waited until the last minute to put my presentation together. So I was cramming for it to get it done. So I hope it's OK for everybody. It's pretty much my opinions of somebody who's gone through 30 years with his degree and the things that I've been very lucky to be able to achieve. One of the things I decided uh, when I got here uh, was first to think about 1986. I mean, it's a long time ago. Uh, I was looking at world events in 1986. And some of the things that I saw was uh, the Challenger uh, space shuttle had exploded. That was the first uh, shuttle ex uh, accident that had occurred. I remember exactly where I was. I would just gotten done eating two slices of pizza at Got Cosmos with my Coke that I always got and was walking up University uh, Avenue when I heard the news and was shocked because it was a horrible day that day. Um, other things that happened during that year, uh, Chernobyl uh, blew up, Chernobyl accident in Russia. Uh, Haley's Comet went by, and I guess you folks might get a chance to see it again because it comes back in 2061. I don't know if I'm going to be around then. Uh, also, uh, you know, probably something that hits a little bit closer to home, you know, you, you, if you watch the news or if you watch any of the economic uh, indicators that are out there today. Uh, the Dow Jones, which you hear on the news all the time now, which is at roughly, I don't know, 23, 24,000. In 1986, it was at a whopping 1,850. Um, and a gallon of gas was 89 cents. So the reason I thought about that is because it, it, a lot has changed. And for you, students, unlike when I was going to school, you hear about how people going into the workforce today, they have to assume they're going to have to change several times in their career. Now, I didn't really think that I was changing. I was kind of doing the same thing, but I was changing because I was doing different businesses and was lucky to be able to do them. But that change is something you have to just accept. It's coming. And it's going to happen. And the things that you talk about today that's world events, you know, 30 years from now, it's not going to seem like uh, such a big deal when you get 30 years from now and the things that you're dealing with then. But um, one of the things that I thought was when I got tried to figure out the title of this, you, your engineering degree, and where you can go is my engineering degree, I just didn't really know what I was getting myself into. I mean, I didn't really appreciate what I had. And where it's taken me, it's taken me all over the world when I never thought, I mean, I thought I'd just be in central Massachusetts in Worcester, Mass. Uh, and that's a great life, but I can't tell you how happy I am that I was able to travel all over the world. And it's a lot to do with coming to Syracuse, getting an engineering degree, and putting it to work. So that title is really to try to say to you and hearing about the world events is talking about all the change that you're going to see and what you can do with it. I write here, this is, uh, you know, your career doesn't have to be a single path, but what I found engineering helped me is that it taught me how to focus. It taught me how to commit myself singularly to a particular issue, whether it be a problem, whether it be a class, whether it be a career, uh, a company position, you, you're going to be faced with going a lot of different directions. But when you're in that direction, you've got to stick with it and you've got to focus on it because it's each and every one of those moments in your life is all going to be about how well you did that because that leads to the next that. And that's really important when 
you start to try to build the kind of person you want to be in the industry. And in engineering, you're given a lot of tools, a lot of value, a lot of ability to do things and go places that a lot of other uh, majors and curriculums just frankly don't allow you to do. When I think about engineering, you know, reality is it's, it's everywhere. I mean, it's demanded all over the world. You can go anywhere on this planet and you're going to find places to apply engineering. You're going to be able to find uh, it in all areas of our economy. Whether or not you do big business or whether you're an entrepreneur and you're starting businesses, engineering is applicable as well. It doesn't apply to whoever, whatever sex you are and, you know, in my opinion, it enhances society's aspirations. I mean, think about the things that have come out of engineering that have made people dream and do things they never would have done before. Simple example being cell phones and smartphones. The kinds of things you can do now that you didn't even, I mean, I didn't even think about that stuff. It wasn't even in my realm of thinking. Uh, and that type of work is the type of work you're in. This is what you are about to do and you're about to uh, go off into the world and do. But as I said, experience is critical. What you do today, tomorrow, your next job, whatever it is, it's critical because it's going to make you the person you want to be and the person you want to promote. Because you got to promote yourself. And in engineering, one of the things that's critical for yourself is making sure that when you go out into the industry, you give yourself the best chance to succeed. And the best chance of success comes through building your knowledge, and building your knowledge comes through growing your experience. What's, you know, I write up here, there's a lot of ways that you can build your experience. Uh, I mean, I remember on my first job interview, because I uh, coached a basketball, junior high basketball team, the person that happened to be hiring me thought that that was a good piece of experience for potentially being a project manager. So a lot of the things that you do, and I heard a lot of great things when I was talking to many of you today, a lot of the things that you do in the way of giving back to your community, doing other different types of uh, extra effort that you're out there doing, that's all stuff that helps to grow your experience. Even though you may not think so, even though it may not come in a nice piece of paper or certificate, doing those things builds your ability that you would not have had otherwise if you didn't do it. Obviously, the, the first job is always critical. I mean, I've, had, I've interviewed many, many engineers in my time, and I'm not going to lie, when I interview, I look right away. Have they had a job yet? What have they done? And Absent of a job, it's about what type of extra effort you do, what type of community work that you do, what type of clubs that you're in, what type of work you do outside of school, and of course, the schoolwork that you do. But showing what you do outside of your academic resume is gigantic for that first opportunity. Clearly, if you get internships, that's important, but showing that you are someone that can do and is interested in going to multiple places to apply your effort is huge for anybody looking for that first job. My experience, and one of the things that uh, I was going to talk about today about how I used engineering in talking about my first company uh, is, or my first, I guess you could say, successful company. Uh, you know, before I even went to college, before I even came here, I was growing up in a machine shop. So I sat on lathes and milling machines, manufacturing different types of medical devices, uh, dealt with working on manual machines, CNC machines, and this is back in the early 80s, so imagine the machines you have in your shop downstairs compared to 35, 40 years ago, they were very different. Uh, CNC was very different. There was no such thing as CAD. Uh, CAD was not around. Everything was on a drafting board. I actually grew up drafting the, the machine drawings you do in your classes. I used to hand draw all that stuff. Uh, and I uh, had a whole box 
of different kinds of tools for drawing. So that was something that I just had to do because my father made me do it. But aside from that, then I came here, got a mechanical engineering degree, got a great opportunity to work with, and I heard his name today uh, as well, uh, Fred Warner, uh, working over at Upstate Medical Center on a total wrist implant. And that wrist implant uh, was used in a simulator, which at the time, Syracuse was one of the only universities that had such a wrist simulator for describing the kinematics of the human wrist. So I was hugely uh, fortunate to actually be involved in that project and uh, was ironically today, 35, 30 years ago, I am now actually, and I didn't plan it this way, it just kind of worked out this way, I'm working in my current company uh, on a total wrist. And that total wrist actually is being worked on through uh, the Hospital for Special Surgery in Manhattan, which if you know it, it's the largest orthopedic hospital in the country. And the chief of upper extremity at HSS worked with Dr. Warner years ago and have papers on risk kinematics years ago. And now when I sit here working with him and our intersection is Dr. Warner and Syracuse University in a wrist. It's sort of irony that I'm going to be sitting in front of FDA in about another six weeks talking about how to get this product into the U.S. market. So it's crazy. This stuff you don't know, you don't realize where you're where you're sitting. You're you're at the beginning of all that. At that time when I left Syracuse, I worked at Stryker. And if any of you are interested in medical device orthopedics, you probably know that name. They're in Jersey. I worked there. Then I left there to go work for a startup orthopedic company down in Gainesville, Florida called Exact Tech. Then I came back to the family business, as uh, Dean Dahlberg was saying, to work with my brother in the family business, manufacturing. And it wasn't until after that that I decided to start my own company. I was ready to finally do something that I was waiting to do. And I failed miserably at it. It was terrible. And uh, it was one of those situations where I spent uh, any, all of, any and all the money I had, and uh, it didn't fly. And I had to go back and work with the old brother in the family manufacturing business until a few years later. And I said, yeah, I want to try this again, but I want to do it someplace different. I want to do it in the spine. <clears throat> Of course, after my experience and my performance on the first try, I wasn't getting too much of a uh, you know, hip hip hooray, but I actually did talk them into letting me get involved with it again and began a company called Blackstone Medical, which was a spinal implant company. But the point for telling you all that is I was 33 by that time. I had been out of college already for 10 years, over 10 years. So the amount of experience that was required, the amount of knowledge that you're building all during that time is all important for when you, if you choose to do your own business or if you choose to go on that next big career change, those are the things that you got to draw on to make your choice. Because that is where you're going to ultimately end up having an opportunity to decide in a logical way What's, is this a good decision or a bad decision? Is this a low risk decision as I've come to you know, live? Low risk versus high risk. You know? what's, what's a low risk decision? In engineering, you know, we all do a risk analysis. You know, you're trying to drive the risk down as much as you can. Engineering, one of the greatest things I loved about it is it's all about problem solving. And it's not about solving the problem when the moment you see it. It's about solving the problem because you break it down. You break it down into pieces and you solve each problem, each piece of the problem systematically until you come to an overall solution. So by this time, I had had a fair amount of experience to look at going into a new business after having an engineering degree, after growing, after working at a big company, a small company, after failing at a company. Okay, what's different about this decision versus the last? And it really was about knowing myself what I could do. So Blackstone <coughs> was founded in 1996. 
uh, orthopedic implant company. It competed with companies like J&J, Stryker, all the major companies. We produced a variety of different implants. By the time it was acquired, it was doing close to $120 million at about year 10. And uh, it had grown from zero people to 200 people. And uh, it was a great experience. It not only uh, was a great experience to be a part of something successful like that, but it exposed me and many of the people that were with me to so many different aspects of the business and the things that make us what we are today, experience, uh, so that I could then move on to other things and do other things that I wanted to do. But what Blackstone and part of this talk here it was to me is it helped shape things that I thought were important. And when you think about what you might do in the future and you think about how do you make, how do you, like I've sat with several of you today and I got asked a few times, how did you know, you know, or did you want to start a company? Or did you always know you wanted to start a company? Yes, I did. I did always know I wanted to start my own company. How did you know that was the right company and it, or how did you know that was gonna be successful? I didn't. I had one that failed. I have others that have failed. I've, I've gone on to do three, four other companies since then, since this company. And this company was 2006, it wasn't mine anymore. So you, you do your best, you make your choices, you break them down the problem, and you try to make the right decisions. But in the end, there's a lot of things that can go wrong or a lot of things that can go right. <clears throat> when I look at the things that I've always had to do, I look at some of the key things that have helped me make what I think are good decisions. And one of the first things I always learned coming out of school and doing any new project is using what I've learned. And the simplest form, as I show our lovely Link Hall here, is you know, drawing on what you know. When I first got my first job out of college and was working in orthopedics, you know, you're, you're, it's the first time you actually now put in a situation where everything you learn in these walls now there's no students around, there's no professors around. It's actually you and you've got to deliver something. And it's those moments where you have to rely on everything you've learned here to deliver. And the great thing about that, delivering, is how good it makes you feel when it's right. Because it builds your confidence, and it not only builds your confidence, it builds your credibility. And that is the very beginning of experience. You start to learn what it is you can do, how to do it, and why it's important. One of the things that's hugely overlooked many times is we get so excited about what we're going to work on with this project we have, this product idea that we have, and I saw many of your great product ideas today, is we just automatically believe it's going to, be, it's going to succeed because it's so great. We love it. The only problem is we normally are the ones who love it the most. And knowing your market is critical for success. If you don't dig into the market and understand what are the nuances of it, you can't possibly react when things go wrong with your idea. And I guarantee you, they will go wrong. You will be faced with having to make changes and decide how do I deal with this problem. And the problems could be as simple as, I didn't know that the product could, couldn't uh, be made out of this material. Now I've got to make it out of a different material. Well, is that material even acceptable for this particular device that I've come up with? You know, it might be as something as simple as, you know, also, hey, I, I, this thing costs far more than I ever dreamed it would cost. It would never sell in the market. I've watched and I've told an example today of a major orthopedic company. Won't name names, but you know, you put band-aids on your cuts every time, and that company. <laughs> that company spent hundreds of millions of dollars on a artificial disc implant and 
took a guess or took a bet on whether or not it would get paid for it when they got it to the US market. And what ended up happening is, is the market, the regulatory systems and the insurance systems did not believe in the data that was given and therefore, or didn't think it was convincing enough and therefore did not give a reimbursement code. That company had spent over almost a half a billion dollars on this product and couldn't make, couldn't bill for it. Couldn't bill for it. Put it in somebody and couldn't get paid for it because there was no way that our system would recognize that device to pay the company. Now getting paid and dealing with the FDA are two different things. You could get it through FDA. FDA said it was perfectly safe. But if you can't get paid for it because you've got to deal with that side of your business, that's a big problem. So knowing your market is critical. You've got to try to know as much of the challenges and the nuances of that market, because if you don't, you're going to be faced with problems you never thought were problems. You know, this is, this is pretty simple, but I find that people think that they do hard work and then realize that what they thought was hard work, they had more to do. The people who succeed in my experience, my time, they're all the time working. I said that my, I had a friend, still a friend. I remember he used to say to me, I work to live. I don't live to work. That's what he used to say to me. I used to go, yeah, okay, okay, all right. So he's someplace and I'm here talking to all of you and I work very hard at what I do I work a lot. I don't have Monday through Friday. I don't have seven days. I don't have get up at seven and work until five. I just work. It's always in my head. I'm always thinking about work. Might sound boring, but yes, I do have social life. I like, like just a couple of months going to see Radiohead with my kids. So look, I just love what I do. So I'm doing it all the time. And I'm sure all of you could say the same thing. Things that you love to do, it's not, you don't turn it off. You don't get up on Tuesday and say, I don't do that on Tuesday. It's, you do it all the time. So hard work at achieving your success, being in engineering in particular, teaches us hard work, teaches us how to do this and how to not stop doing it, not be, daunted by challenges, that is what really sets you apart. And it does set you apart in industry, believe me. <clears throat> Be uncomfortable. This is one of the hardest things that I always had to, you know, accept even myself. Because as I say here, you know, your knowledge and your experience, it, that's, I've been talking about that. You gotta know, you gotta grow your experience. But the reality is, that's there so that you can put yourself in an uncomfortable position. Because it's the unknown that you're always trying to determine, you're always trying to explore when you're trying to progress. And one of the things that I find has always been, you know, difficult is putting myself into that uncomfortable position. Putting myself in places and choosing a market or choosing a product idea or making a decision uh, when dealing with FDA that means the difference between yes or no, a product is gonna get cleared. You, you have to put yourself in those positions because all you can do when you want to advance is take a risk. And again, as engineers, it's all about trying to reduce the risk. So what do we use? We use our knowledge, we use our experience to come up with a path, a solution that allows us to make the decision that we think has the least chance to screw up. Lowest risk. So being uncomfortable in what you do, taking those chances, that's part of it. You have to do that. You have to be willing to take that risk. And what you have to use to help you get through it is the knowledge and experience that you go through. Meet the customer. Many times, uh, and the customer, you know, you could be 
working, uh, you know, in General Motors on, on fuel injection, you know, the customer could be the next department that has to deal with putting that fuel injector together. Or, in my case, it's talking to a surgeon. But knowing who the customer is and hearing what it is that they think is important about what you do is important. Because if you don't do that, you could be making stuff that nobody cares about. Or making stuff even worse that people care about, but they don't care about it the right way. And knowing who your customer is increases your chances for success because you're making what they're telling you they want. And what we do, is particularly in product development, which is critical in engineering, is making what the unmet need is asking for. Identifying what that unmet need is, which is generally understanding what the customer, what the customer is telling you, gets you in the position to decide not only what am I making, but I'm making the thing that I'm being asked to make. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a room where the joke is, we engineers, we come up with solutions where there wasn't a problem. And I've listened, I've sat in operating rooms where a doctor looks at me and takes the instrument out and goes, who came up with this? And throw it across the operating room. Because it doesn't work in the space that they're dealing with. Knowing what your customer wants, knowing what it is they're expecting from you, that's important when trying to succeed at being a well-rounded engineer, developing devices, developing systems, developing companies, whatever it might be. <clears throat> Beware of success. I was talking about this a little earlier today with one of the, one of the groups. And what I mean by that is, you know, we struggle so much to succeed, succeed, get, and success is measured in many, many ways. But success in being promoted to another position, success in your product being successful in the market, success that you've moved on to another company that, you know, now you've got a new position, whatever it is. Success can be somewhat of a problem in terms of creating some level of uh, change in what you think is important. And what I've seen in my experience is success can sometimes make you think, I don't need to do that anymore because now I've, I've gotten myself to this place and this doesn't require me. A perfect example is uh, I've hired people who were great at what they did and then they got promoted and then the, they didn't need to do certain things anymore. They didn't need to uh, you know, be involved with certain engineering decisions. I've had engineering managers work for me that when they got promoted to be the manager, one of the other engineers now needed to find out what were the labeling requirements or what were the titanium anodized requirements or what was the heat treatment requirement for the mater material. You know, what was the FDA, you know, the ASTM standard that was required. They didn't have to know that stuff anymore. That's what the other engineers are for now. And as I say here, you know, recognize the difference between micromanaging and knowing the subject, where you don't need to necessarily, when you move to that next level after su some success, still do everything, but you need to know everything. It never ends. It never ends. You need to know everything. You move up the ladder, you got to know all of them that you just passed. There is no forgetting them. And I find that many times people don't do that. They got past that leather stair and that's in the past. I don't have to worry about it anymore. No, that is not true. You have to know every step you pass and the one before that and the one before that. Because it's important for you to help not only those that are now making the decisions with you. But it's also important for you because you have to know that things are getting done correctly. I've watched things go off the rails because people thought they didn't need to do that and somebody else who didn't really quite have the same experience made a decision that this time it went to the bad when it easily could have gone to the good if 
people who are involved. So always know, it doesn't matter what your level of success is, you're always still involved. You always are there. You always have to be on 24-7. Don't be intimidated. Yeah, this is kind of whether you're going out into your job or in my world, I'm a small company person dealing with multi-billion dollar companies. It's hard not to be intimidated. I mean, I walk into hospitals all day long talk about this singular product I have, and they talk about how Johnson & Johnson serves us everything from a Band-Aid to a hip implant, and you know, you got this one thing, Matt, so I'd rather just deal with Johnson & Johnson. You have to be able to show you're just as good and why you are who you are. But Johnson & Johnson, it's not like they're a bunch of slouches, obviously. You gotta respect your competition. You gotta respect the others that you work with. You gotta respect even other devices that are out there on the market that are good. Can't discount them. You can't be intimidated by them either. But be better than them. You absolutely have the opportunity to be better than them. That's what we learn here is how to improve, how to make something that it, that's there today superior based upon, again, knowledge and experience. But knowing that when you're out there, there's a lot of other people just like you trying to do the exact same thing. You're not alone in your quest. There's others doing the exact same thing. And knowing that should keep you to that mindset of, as I mentioned before, Always on, always on. And that's what I find engineering has always taught me, always on. Future challenges are inevitable. So as I mentioned, I've, I've, I've built six companies, I've had two of them fail. I had one do okay, I had one do great and I'm currently in one that's doing pretty good as well. And being able to accept that that's gonna happen, as well as the good, you have to be ready for that. And it's easy, as I'm sure you can imagine, for somebody like me to say, oh, you can just quit. But what I find is, as I write here, staying power is king. Being in the game, recognizing that what you're working on, whether it's a project, whether it's a product, whether it's a company, it's all about sticking with it. You cannot at one moment think, does anybody here, I mean, when, when, when an answer comes easy on a test like this, do you ever just stop and go, is that really the right answer? <laughs> it's never, it, there's always that hesitation you know, and that aspect of it is all about recognizing that, you know, failure or challenges, they're there. They're always there. And being able to power through them, knowing that you got the tools that you need to power through them is always going to go a long way in achieving what you want to achieve. So this is a quote happened to be, I don't know if anybody saw that movie, um, Darkest Hour, but I've read a lot about Winston Churchill. That's why I watched that movie too. But here's a guy who, if you know anything about the man, he's a great example of somebody who did lots of great things, lots of, made a lot of mistakes as well, was top of the game in front of everybody for a period of time and then was cast aside, always throughout his entire career, up and down, up and down, up and down. But he's considered probably one of the most, you know, accomplished people in the 20th century. But his, his uh, quote here, I think is awesome, I love it. You know, I mean, success is not final. That's big. That's really big, because it's very easy to go, damn, I did good on that. And you stop, you pause. You should never. 
Don't ever think that. You did good on it, go get the next thing. Pat yourself on the back for a minute. But move. But failure as well, not fatal. It's going to happen. Don't think that it's not. It is. But in the end, it's really about who's going to keep going. It's all about hard work. It's all about using what you've learned. And it's all about continuing to try to make good decisions, low risk decisions. This guy, in my opinion, constantly faced with that, hit the highest of highs, has been down at the lowest lows. But certainly, you can see in the end, in the final analysis, I think most people would say he came up on the upside. So my final statement to you all. Um, you know, you got to make a lot of decisions in your life. And you've selected a, a spot to be in in engineering, which in my opinion, you're all in a position of a lot of opportunities that can be in front of you. You could all have an opportunity to be in places based upon engineering and the engineering curriculum you're taking now and the engineering opportunities you're going to have in the future that will open up new opportunities for you to even pursue further. It's a great spot to be. There's never a low demand for engineers. Never. There's always demand for engineers. You may not like sometimes that you have to go to some part of the country to go do it. You may not be able to do it in your backyard necessarily, but it's always in demand. So. With that said, I, I appreciate your attention. Hope I uh, gave you a little bit of something to think about as you go forward. Um, thank you, and uh, good luck to all of you for the rest of the year. So one of the hardest parts about engineering, I've been studying engineering for four years, is how do you start an assignment or a problem or even homework? So as someone who's started many companies, which is really impressive, where do you start if you have an idea? What's step one on the drawing board? You know, I, in my world, it's all about what's happening out there. I never say, you know what? There's not an implant for, you know, the third toe from the right. I don't think that. I think about what's going on out in the world. What is everybody talking about? And that's where I say, oh, let me, let me go check out what these people are talking about. And the more I dig into what they're talking about, I find out that they're talking about things that sometimes there's problems. And a lot of times that's where ideas come from where you find out from people in this world things that they need, that's where ideas come from. That's where a, pro that's where a company comes from. I didn't have any idea. I, Blackstone Medical, before I started that company, never did a spinal implant in my life. Not a single one. But I, I designed hip implants. I designed knee implants. And I knew the space, I knew what FDA was about. Everything I heard about the spine market at that time was going like this. I said, holy cow, let's, let's make spine implants. We can do that. We, do not, we don't have to do all this other stuff. It's just, make, it's just a different part of the body. Just got to learn the part of the body, learn the loads there, and we're off to the races. Let's do it. That's how I do it. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so you started out in mechanical engineering and then find yourself working in the uh, biotech industry. Do you have any advice for any of us that have started our, you know, our degree in one area and kind of want to shift into another area of focus? You know, the, you'd be surprised, uh, especially when you're in a space like engineering, uh, the ease of being able to switch. There is, you, you're in a space that different disciplines within this space are sought after across schools or across uh, industries. Because in this, in, you know, in so many of these industries today, so many different technologies overlap now into industries, into different disciplines. You look at something like uh, orthopedics. And right now, one of the biggest thing in orthopedics is robotics. And you have software engineers, hardcore in orthopedics now, designing uh, um, software for robotic uh, robots to do joint implants. And those same robots are also delivering the implants in such a way that all of the clinical research that's being generated today is now being generated on the, the acetabular cup goes in and exactly at 30 degrees, because it does, exactly. When I look at people that are in the space, whether they're bioengineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, they have an opportunity because of engineering, because that's a high demand space, to veer off into other areas. Now, does an electrical engineer walk in and start designing hip implants? No. There's some limits to what I'm saying. But does bioengineering and biomechanics, or does uh, electrical engineering, which is very much in uh, orthopedics as well in the way of diagnostics, do they, can you move into those places? Yes, you can with relative ease. And I, wouldn't, I would not say that unless I've seen it happen. I've, I've hired people that uh, work in my, research, my product development group. Uh, some of them are mechanical, some of them are bio, some of them are engineer, uh, electrical, but their experience has helped them to be that way. All right, we have time for one more question, if there's another question from the audience. All right, if not, I'm going to uh, thank Matt. Please join me in thanking Matt for his presentation. <laughs>